Okay, so with this game, I only watched the first first half live uh, and the second half, uh, I'm kind of caught up with the highlights. So this is going to kind of be a bit of a different video where I'm going to talk about what I saw in the first half because I think it was so key to realising why South Africa can beat New Zealand, considering how the last game went in the Rugby Championship and what this means for the Rugby World Cup. And at the end, I'd like you to tell me what you saw in the second half and if it was much of the same, because the score suggests to me that it was. So I'll just get straight into it. So South Africa, before the game even started, selected a pack that uh, was huge, right? Big guys, uh, basically grafters over kind of flair. I'm talking about uh, the Newland coming in for Jasper Visa. Peter Steph Tui, uh, Tui, however you say his name is, he came in at seven, who's a much bigger player than they usually have playing at seven. Sometimes they play Franco Mostert there. They put Franco Mostert in the, in the back rows. Malcolm Mark started, which he didn't in the rugby championship game. And I thought this was really key because when I did that review on the rugby championship game between South Africa and New Zealand, the smaller, lighter pack that they had in the first half was changed pretty quickly into the, into the second half. And you could see that when they did this, they kind of choked the possession out of New Zealand. They managed to slow the ball down. They managed to kind of get under their skin. They managed to create turnovers. And it meant that New Zealand couldn't play with the flair and fluidity that they like in their back line. And that's what I saw a lot of in this first half, that it just seemed like New Zealand kind of got the life choked out of them because they had the possession choked out of them. The forwards of South Africa were more physical. And, and on top of that, I think New Zealand kind of got called out on their BS in terms of uh, playing right on the line, in terms of uh, breaking the laws. Now, I've had a short video that's uh, had a lot of comments from, I presume, a few New Zealanders. And they're not happy with the fact that Sam Kane, I caught in one video, it was clearly obstructing. And I think it's more of a talking point of a bigger, bigger point. And New Zealand aren't certainly the only big team, great team that play on the line of the laws and they usually kind of get away with it. It's a sign of a good team these days. I think Ireland do it. I think South Africa do it. But sometimes when you play on that close to the line every now and again you're going to go over the line and someone's going to notice it and the referee was really keen especially right at the beginning of two line outs two line outs in a row on the five meter line south africa i think it was franco mostot was taken out in the middle of the air and he had his legs up in the middle of the air and he got penal and new zealand got penalized twice for that and that really just kind of cascaded to new zealand constantly getting penalized for basically for things that maybe they wouldn't have gotten penalised before, but were definitely penalties. And I think when you concede two penalties that early on, it sets a frame of reference in the referee's mind to basically look out for it more often than he would have beforehand. Whereas in other games with New Zealand, maybe you're not penalised that early and it's not caught out and you're allowed to get away with things like the Sam Kane incident that I made a short of. Don't get annoyed, it's just the reality. Anyway. They get called out, and it just meant that they kind of got choked at possession in my eyes. I saw, I think in the first half as well, Manny Libok, another great game. I think he's a really exciting prospect for the World Cup. He has South Africa playing in a completely different way. I'm talking possession rugby, holding onto the ball, a great distributor, getting it to the outside quickly, and, you know, maybe some of the forwards are happy that they've got to fly half like that. It means that they're always on the front foot, they're not having to make... 100 tackles a game and it's really exciting to watch because that back line of the South Africa's it just needs unlocking they've got excellent wingers even in their reserves they've got William LaRue at fullback William Sir played in this game um, and he also played, played, played pretty well from what I saw and I think Andre Esterhazen as well has really played had a really good game in that 12 shirt he's Andre, Andre Esterhazen is a huge bloke but that's not his only game he is great in decision making his kicking's great he has such a finesse style of rugby he really is kind of like a Rob Gronkowski of the rugby world of being such a big guy but also being very skillful and agile in what he does uh, and very dexterous so I think he should be the 12 I know that there's a bit of legacy with the guy who's in there at the moment so maybe that's why he's not being selected um, on the New Zealand side of things well, I don't really know what to do I mean it seems like New Zealand have like one style of rugby that they do at like a 10 out of 10 level, but it seems to be able to be counteracted by this kind of power game of South Africa, as was evidence in the game yesterday. So if you're New Zealand, 
you're not going to know the style of rugby. I, I don't know really how you kind of counteract this uh, kind of choking philosophy that they have on your possession and your play style. It's a very difficult one to solve because South Africa seems to be the only team that are really able to do this to you. Maybe Ireland is probably uh, another shout for that as well, considering how the series went the last time that Ireland were in New Zealand as well. Um, and you haven't got long to figure it out either. You've got two weeks and no games, uh, and then you're going to be playing France, who, yes, very good defensively. Um, they're not a possession team, so maybe you'll get the ball more to be able to do more, uh, more, for, more things with the ball, but it could be difficult. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, before this game, I thought New Zealand was probably the team to beat in the, in the World Cup. I think they, they were probably number one in my eyes, but... South Africa might have just edged him out in this, uh, just because of how dominant this performance was. So credit to South Africa, uh, and you're really South Africa really are kind of turning the key and turning the screw right at the right time for this World Cup. So fascinating World Cup for both these teams. South Africa, uh, kind of South Africa and Scotland in their group are looking the hottest teams out of them. Ireland are looking pretty good, but it's so many question marks for me with Johnny Sexton coming back in at ten after having not played them so long. Obviously. Uh, Ireland have a bit of time to get their act together and there's probably I have full, full faith that they do it's just I've seen Scotland and South Africa already achieve that faith because of how they've played and on France's side of things you're in a group with New Zealand and Italy I guess you could say in terms of being competitive so we'll see I mean if you're New Zealand you're probably more than likely going to get out of the group stages and then you're going to be playing either South Africa Ireland or Scotland so uh, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be easy, considering that I think two of those teams, South Africa and Ireland, can play a style of rugby that seems to really counteract what you do. So, interesting food for thought, and we'll see how the World Cup envelops. Can't wait. Illuminati confirmed.